right. Well, um, Friday was a day of elation for the constituents of Miku North, especially the fisher folks of Miku North, because as you would recall on several occasions, I've been here, I've made announcements about the jetty, I've given you all progress reports as to where we are. So I was extremely happy um, to officially open the jetty on Friday. I can tell you that um, from the testimonials I received from the fishermen, they're extremely excited. This is a project that they've been waiting for for decades. Um, on numerous occasions, even in the House of Parliament, I've addressed the plight of the fishermen as it relates to them having to traverse the sargasm to be able to get to their boats. I'm sure that you'd have heard stories about fishermen getting rashes, fishermen um, being unable to ply their trade because of them being unable to access their boats. And I'm very happy that once and for all, the fishermen have a jetty that they can call theirs. And it's not just, I, I think, Everyone here knows the story of the floating jetty before um, we were actually able to build a timber jetty for them. And now that they have a solid timber jetty, I can tell you that the jetty is, um, in terms of durability, we expect it to be even more durable than what already exists in Savans Bay and in Prale. And it's something that brought quite a bit of excitement. It was not just the jetty. The jetty was just one part of what happened on Friday. We also opened a washroom facility, and notwithstanding what we've heard, um, about the whole cabinet of ministers coming down <laughs> to open a washroom facility. It speaks to the significance and importance of projects like these that have a serious impact, positive impact on the lives and livelihoods of our fishermen. Prior to having the washroom, I don't need to tell you where the fishermen used to go or how they used to um, urinate or other things. So, and we understand that it was not just unsightly, um, it's not, it was not hygienic either. And being able to give them a washroom facility under jetty, um, I was very happy. I was, I mean, I was beaming with emotions on, on Friday because to see that come to realization was, uh, I felt like, you know, finally, because this thing, and I mean, we've heard the stories, we've seen the pictures, and to be able to see that come to reality was a very fulfilling day for me, a very satisfying day. So I'm happy that we were able to deliver the jetty and also the washroom facility for the fishermen. What has the feedback been from the fishers? Have they begun using the jetty and the washroom facilities? Oh yeah, um, the washroom, the jetty. Whilst we were building the jetty, we saw the fishermen already making use of it. Um, even before we did the official opening, the fishermen were already making use of the jetty. And I think those of you who were present on Friday, you all would have realized that there's already a buildup of sargassum creating a problem for access. So. Um, obviously they would have to utilize the jetty to be able to access their boat. So it started working even before we officially opened it. And the fishermen are very excited. I can tell you they're very satisfied. Um, I want to thank them for their patience because it is something I said has been a long time coming. The fishermen have waited for decades. They've made, they've cried administration after administration. They've been crying and, and, and clamoring for a jetty. So I was happy that, I mean, under my watch, I was able to bring that dream, make that dream a reality for the fishermen. And I said it, I did not make that dream a reality because I just was trying to gain political points. You have to actually be there to witness what it is that the fishermen go through firsthand for you to understand the importance of putting a jetty um, or building a jetty for the fishermen. And when you see, it's twofold. They have a difficulty to access their boats and when they return now with their catch, people are reluctant to buy or to purchase what they catch because they have to pass through the sargassum. We were able to eliminate that problem with the construction of a jetty. So I know that it, this jetty is going to bring about quite a bit of positive benefits for the fishermen and they are extremely excited. I mean, I go by the bay and I mean, the only thing you can hear is good things. The only thing you can hear is good things. The washroom is equally as important as I would have said because um, prior to the washroom being there, some of the fishermen had to resort to using a public facility, which is the laundry. And then you have, you bring in fresh water into an area where people are washing their clothes and it was not hygienic and they, they, there's that cross-contamination. So being able to eliminate that problem, I think the fishermen are very, very excited. So am I. In light of the two double homicides we had over weekend, um, in terms of your portfolio, crime prevention, I wanted to know where we are with the development of the national anti-crime plan that was announced when you were first appointed. Um, where are we with that? Have you had consultation so far with the different stakeholders? Okay, so um, I mean, what happened over the weekend was, I mean, it's very sad. 
um, where we had four young individuals, and I think it's also always important to mention it's four young individuals who fell victim um, to gun violence again. Notwithstanding, I think about the national crime prevention strategy, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, so I don't want to give anybody any sort of false hope or false expectations so that next week when I return to um, press briefing, I'm asked again, so where are we in terms of the, I'm, I'm going to keep you updated. I have started the engagement with stakeholders. I've met um, commerce, um, I've met civil society, I've met um, the chamber, um, other individuals who have an interest, I've met some NGOs, and we started a discussion. I've also engaged two or three individuals who can serve in the capacity of consultant, and we've not um, chosen a consultant, but we're in the process of trying to identify a proper consultant to put together um, a national crime prevention strategy. So um, that, as I said, will take some time. Notwithstanding that it's going to take some time, we continue our efforts. You would have seen, I think, two Fridays ago, this Friday, um, the Friday before, where, again, we would have made a contribution to the police in our attempts to be able to combat the situation. I mean, the police tell you that they have limited resources, and giving them the resources will be able to assist in their attempts. We've, we gave them, I think, somewhere in the range of about 28 vehicles, uh, vehicles, ATVs, motorcycles, jet skis, to help with their efforts um, in combating crime. But we have to also take into consideration that, yes, there were four homicides, and you have to think about Here's what the police have been doing a lot, and I want to commend them for their efforts to suppress crime and to suppress criminal activity. All the homicides that were recorded over the weekend were gun related. The police also recovered four or five firearms over the course of the weekend. They also recovered four or five um, firearms. And what that speaks to is the heavy influx of firearms into um, our borders. And we really have to reconsider our modus operandi. I understand that we may have, um, our borders may be a bit porous, and we're working to try to, to tighten it and to try to strengthen um, what currently exists at our entry, our port of entries. And there is a serious problem as it relates to firearm availability on the streets. And if we have four young people who died and they, would, and they died because of gun-related violence. And then you have, in that same weekend, the police record successes of five recovering five firearms. Then, I mean, it's a really a time for us to pause and stop and maybe reimagine, rethink how we do some of the things, especially our entry, our entry points, our ports of entries. Because I can tell you these firearms are not being manufactured in St. Lucia. They're not homemade guns as, as we used to hear a long time ago. These firearms have been brought here from overseas, and we will be giving serious consideration um, as it relates to our entry, our ports of entries, and reconsidering and looking at how we do business there because we cannot continue along these lines. We cannot continue if I am just coming to St. Lucia, like you know. So, we will be giving some serious consideration to that particular um, part of, of crime fighting. Okay, um, just. Um, so the washroom cost just under two hundred thousand dollars to be able to build it. Well, we refurbished the washroom because there was a washroom there, but it was um, we, that washroom was not operational for the past, I think, over twenty-five years. So we had to do some refurbishing works and to make it functional. It cost just a little under two hundred thousand dollars, and the jetty cost just a little over a million dollars. Um, just some information here. The border, border control entity, is that still on stream, the creation of a border control entity? I know early in the administration taking over, um, there was talk about it. It seemed they were going to continue with that um, initiative. Is, is it what's happening? There is still, um, I cannot give you a, a conclusive answer on, on the border control. I can tell that conversations are still happening and we've not taken a final decision as it relates to border control. Okay, um, in the last month, we saw this um, gentleman who would have worked with the Taiwanese technical mission. Um, he would have trained our officers uh, months prior to that um, in cybersecurity. This man being arrested by U.S. authorities. Um, what information have you received in relation to that? Because knowing that he has, he spent time here and also training our police in um, dealing with these very same matters, um, what are your thoughts on it? 
Well, I cannot speak to um, that particular matter. I don't have the facts before me, um, so I'm not in a position to to speak exclusively on that particular matter. Um, one question for me, going back to Jesse. The statement made, the statement made by the leader, of, the leader of the opposition on the toilets thing. I know it's something that seemed, um, you know, like just something you say in passing, but when he said all the ministers went to Miku to open a toilet, his, his words. What does that thing, what does that, what, does that, what does that say? What do you feel when you hear that? And where do you think that comes from? Well, um... And, and is, are we making too much fuss of a jetty? Is that, is, is that too much fuss? No, 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 no. If you, if you come down to Mikud and you speak to the fishermen, you would appreciate that we're not even making enough of a fuss about the jetty. And that speaks to the significance of the jetty. But the opposition leader's statement about the entire cabinet coming down to open a toilet in Mikud North, it just speaks how I feel about it, especially as a young man, is that this man has no sort of, of, of he had no sort of understanding about the projects that positively impact the people. And I'm sure that the people of Miku took serious offense to that statement. And I can tell you, because the people of Miku were very happy to have the entire cabinet of ministers present with them on Friday. So for the leader of opposition to come and say, and there was a deliberate attempt on his part to forget the jetty and to say that the cabinet came down just to open a toilet. And it just speaks to the type of, 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 of person, the character of the leader of the opposition, for him to declare war. I mean, he just tells you, and in a time when we have so much happening, especially as it relates, I mean, I just spent several minutes speaking about um, gun violence and the impact of, of gun violence here in St. Lucia. And for the leader of opposition to make such a reckless statement and to declare war, and to even send a warning to civils, um, civil servants to come in for them. I mean, this is reckless. Nobody should endorse a statement like that. I think his own members should encourage him to retract that statement, although I don't know if retracting it means that he actually feels that he needs to retract it, if he's just going to do it for media purposes. But we should <coughs> always, as leaders, and as people who, we have young people who look at us, who expect us to make responsible statements. When we make such reckless and irresponsible statements, it, I mean, you ask, is this somebody who really wants to be in charge of St. Lucia tomorrow? An opposition, in essence, supposed to be a government in waiting. That's what you're supposed to be. And if not the St. Lucia Labour Party, then it would be you assuming office. And if you're going to assume office and make statements like that, and I understand sometimes um, we get a little lost in the moment and we have money enough to come back and say, you know what, I apologize. And that's why I admire my prime minister, because a few times when, he've made, when he has made errors, or when he felt that he misspoke, he came back and said, here's what, I made an error, I apologize, I'm sorry. But to make reckless, and it has not, this is not the first time that we've heard a reckless statement like that being made from a member of the opposition. We've heard it on numerous occasions. I think one time I mentioned when um, it was at the Sufre bus terminal where they, was, they held a public meeting, and there was a deliberate attempt on the part of the former member for Grosile to get the people to shout it and to ask the people to call the Prime Minister Jackass, and you ask, is that unbecoming of somebody who held a leadership position in this country? And if this is what leadership is, and if that's what we're going to do when we find ourselves in opposition, then I mean, it's really a cause for concern. So sometimes we look at those things, those who are charged with the responsibility, um, who hold the highest office in these lands, when they behave in that way, can you really question why the younger generation find themselves in the position that they find themselves in. And we have a responsibility, it is on us, the onus is on us as leaders to be able to set the example. And I don't think that it is a good example. What we've seen um, coming from the leader of the opposition, I think it warrants uh, an apology. And I think that his colleagues and, and party members should encourage him um, to refrain from making such statements. This is not the first time we've heard, we've heard several remarks um, over the years and has become commonplace with him um, to hear these type of, of, of statements being made. So I think it's sad. It's really a sad day, especially, as I said, given what the current environment that we operate in. Uh, and I really would hope and pray that we would see a statement coming from him where he retracts that statement or publicly apologize and say, well, you know, I made an error, I made an error. But to declare war 
and to tell civil servants that you're coming for them and you want to represent the civil servants is really a cause for concern. Uh, morning. Um, Good morning sir. As a former police officer yourself, um, what are your thoughts on um, reports or speculations that um, police officers are getting uh, actively rather actively involved in partisan politics yeah okay so <laughs> we take an oath to protect and serve and we have a responsibility um, to ensure <laughs> that we don't engage openly notwithstanding that we have a freedom to associate, a right to associate with whichever political party that we have. We should never allow um, our political biases to um, prevent us from doing the work that we've been paid to do. And we see it happening. I mean, I don't want to point out the, the particular examples, but we've seen it happening on numerous occasions where police officers, um, through different means, find ways to engage in the politics of the day. On our end, I think the Prime Minister have said it on numerous occasions where we refuse to engage in um, the, the affairs of the police where we saw under the former administration where there were situations or examples where we saw openly interference with the organization and we heard comments that were really concerning as it relates to how the police run their affairs under the former administration and the Prime Minister has taken a stance and a position not to engage, allow the police to do what the police is paid to do. And the police also have a responsibility to not allow politics to prevent them because they're getting a salary. And it doesn't matter if it is the Central Labour Party or the United Workers Party that is in government, they're getting a salary and their salaries, um, they're paid to do a job and that job is to protect and serve. And that should be at the forefront of, of their, their agenda. However, we find some police officers who are more interested in the politics than the politicians themselves. It shouldn't be. Um, my thing is that I would denounce that type of behavior, not this time we continue to see it perpetuating in society. So you think disciplinary action should be taken against um, such individuals? Well, we have, that is why you have a, a, a disciplinary committee to deal with matters of that sort. And if they figure, or if they, they feel whatever the police does warrants um, disciplinary action, then the mandate is on them to do the necessaries. I cannot tell them how to do their work or who to bring in and question, but I think we have a committee responsible to do that. And if they feel there is a need, then they should do what is necessary. Do you, do you have exact examples of police officers that perhaps their political leanings, or as Mr. Tench was saying, that they're involved in politics, that it is actually interfering with them executing their duties? Yeah, I mean, we've seen police officers go to um, social media pages, Facebook for instance, and make certain remarks on Facebook. Um, the remarks are, are get towards the Prime Minister, derogatory remarks get towards the Prime Minister or to the Minister of Housing or to various ministers. Um, we've seen, I, as I said, I don't want to mention any police officer name, but it's obvious, and it, that has been going on for a while, where we see certain police officers who may even be administrators of social media pages for political parties. So, I mean, it's glaring. Uh, are, are they breaking any particular regulations, rules um, within the police force? Can you enlighten us on that? I cannot tell you exactly what um, the, the, the force order says about um, that particular type of behavior. That is why I said we have a, a committee, and if what they do warrants any sort of intervention, then the committee, the disciplinary committee, has the mandate to be able to deal with that. Thank you. Um, before I pass the mic over, those were just two of my questions. In the follow-up to Mr. Tench, I'll ask my two questions now. Thank you. Um, just a little patience to the back. Thank you so much. Uh, with regard to the crime and young people, we know that we've been saying that the involvement of our young persons in gangs. But under your plan um, to come the crime strategy, uh, the discussions that you are having, is there any intent to include the public in some very open and frank dialogue about the existence of gangs in the country? Are we planning to enlighten the public 
on where exactly those gangs are, their modus operandi, so that when, so that communities have the information that the communities themselves can begin to do some proactive uh, strategies to work alongside the police because it would seem with the absence of that information, communities may not necessarily know how to assist the police. So when are we going to have a national conversation about the existence of the gangs where you can provide us with the much necessary information about the gangs, whether it be the um, colors, if there are any insignia, um, tattoos that they may have, members initiations, things of that sort to really help us understand that. And the second part of my question in relation to that is that the community relations branch of the police force severely understaffed, but they have been the ones mandated to deal directly with our young people, especially at the school level. What is the plan to beef up the numbers in there? And I think just putting in two or three additional officers will not do it. There needs to be a very clear, precise plan, um, not just with numbers, but an exact strategy of how we are now going to engage the young people at the school level so that we can put a stop to, what is it, uh, the six and seven, so that we can stop it in its tracks. Thank you very much. Um, so as it um, pertains to stakeholder engagement and in, um, involving the public, um, it is our intention to have an open national conversation as it relates to crime. Some information, we are not, we are not going to be in a position to um, diverge to the public. And you would understand and you would appreciate that the sensitivity of some of the information, you're just not in a position to, be able to put it out because if you were to put it out, then more or less you're defeating the purpose in terms of um, your efforts to abate the situation. Yes, it is important that the public is made aware of um, where, and I'm, I can tell you that most of the public is aware, notwithstanding that we've not had a national conversation or a national crime symposium where we invite everybody to come in. Most people are aware of where the situation, what the hotspots are, if you want to call them that. And there is the need to do more in terms of enlightening, enlightening some individuals and educating people as to, as you said, what are some of the tattoos, what to look for. And we will be going on, on, on a mission to be able to educate and sensitize people as it relates to that. The CRB. The CRB has a mandate to go out there, the community relations brands go out there, try to abate, especially at the school levels. You're right in terms of them being on the staff. And I must come in for what they've been doing with the little staff that they have. And there is a need to review what they do. I've already spoken to Mr. Hippolyte, and he and I had a, a, a long conversation. And I think they're putting together a proposal, something that would make it, make them as a unit more efficient, more effective. When that proposal is put in place, they will make a presentation to us and we will make a determination. As I can tell you that we are more than open to giving them the support that they require to be able to go out there and do their work. We understand the importance of dealing and nipping with the, the, the situation at the bird. So this government, this administration, myself as a Minister of Crime Prevention, fully supports what it is that the um, CRB is doing and we will provide them with the necessary support. Um, that they need. Sometimes you hear the cries, you know we don't have enough people, we don't have this. And sometimes the cries are made to, it does not reach the executive, and I don't want us to um, play like we operate in an ideal environment. Sometimes when the media ask you a question, when they bring something to your attention, it's the first time that you're hearing it, and everybody understands, or everybody in an administrative position, in an executive position, understands the channel by which um, information comes up. So you write, you express, here's what. I have X, Y, and Z, you justify, you prepare a justification, I need 25 more officers because this is the current situation, I need the 25 officers and they will be able to help me achieve the objective of the department. And you send it up to the hierarchy, and the hierarchy how, now has a responsibility to present and say, okay, here's what prime minister, here's what minister, this is the situation, we need more staff. Sometimes these things never happen. Sometimes we hear, we hear cries from public individuals and we never get the information from the right sources. So that is me saying that it's not that we're not made away, but it has not been brought to my attention personally or through the right medium that there is an issue. Zachary and I spoke and he said that here's what he's going to prepare a proposal and I'm, I await the proposal to see how we can assist him in their efforts. Um, yes, sir. Um, in relation to the crime factor, you know, we, we emphasize a lot on social intervention, you know, 
and you know we've had the RSS come down here. We also had the gender violence campaign. But the follow-up to this, like, you know, even in the gender violence campaign, there was not enough on billboards, there was not, like, could you target persons in the community? We know about Raise Your Voice, we know about um, um, Venus, you know, the, the, um, you know, we know about these groups, but how, how effective are they? You know, we go to these round table discussions, we have all these meetings, all these discussions, but in terms of, like they say, taking it to the community, to the community level, even if it's once a month or, or quarterly, but, you know, driving force this social intervention because we know the RSS is the, you know, the military operations, but in terms of people to people, we need to have certain persons that, you know, you target to go out to the community to find out, and in this way they could relate to the police, because like you say, it's a, a holistic affair, but not enough is being done on the community level to make people aware of the, you know, the dangers of, of this crime scene. Yeah, um, I agree with you to a certain extent that we can do more, um, but I would not agree that um, we're not doing a lot. I think one of the problems you may have is the reporting mechanism so that persons are aware of what is actually happening. For instance, we have Wiry um, currently in Jack Mel, in View Fort, in Grosilly, and they have centers there where they deal one on one with individuals, especially vulnerable individuals. We have um, Prisky Lash and his team who have opened a SEEDS resource center in View Fort, and they too serve more or less like a referral agency where they get individuals who. Um, are vulnerable, they assist them, they provide them, they direct them to the places that they're supposed to go. They have, um, how do you call it, the pantry, where they provide breakfast to vulnerable individuals. There is a lot happening, and I think what we don't see is most of what is happening is not reported. So it goes, people are of the view that there is what? Um, absolutely nothing is happening when that is not the, 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 the reality. People like Venus and, and, and the rest of them are working day in and day, day out. Dr. King and his team are working day in and day out. Rice and Lucia, all of them are, are doing, um, they are playing their part. However, what they don't get is an opportunity like this where they come to a press briefing to, to explain what it is that they're doing, what numbers are they reaching, um, how, how impactful it is, the programs that they're running, how impactful these programs are. So maybe if we can get them and, and get the reports from them too. We'll be able to understand better, appreciate what it is that's happening socially. Even from the government's position, we've, doing, we've done so much to, um, in terms of social interventions. We continue to provide support at every level. If you look at the SSDF, you will look at the, the, the level of support, the, y, um, the MSME loan grant facility, youth economy. I can tell you from my constituency, I have um, 21 young people who are going to be receiving grants this week. All of them are going to be going to the British Army. and. Most times, you, these things would go unreported. So people believe, oh, nothing not happening for our youth. We give them the opportunity. That's why the youth economy was established to ensure that when somebody or, or you have a young person who may, be, who may get an opportunity but may not have the means to be able to go out there and actually do what it is that they dream of doing, the youth economy comes and intervenes and provide them with that little seed capital that they need to start up. So a lot is happening. So you say there's an importance to, to island, yes. even down to the football level. Yeah, yeah, so maybe maybe we, we have to. Correct. Okay, so we know Viewfort was deemed an area of high crime escalation. Is that still the case? And how do we determine where is an escalated crime zone? Because Viewfort hasn't had a homicide in quite a while, but we've seen various homicides in the north of the island and. We haven't heard an announcement about escalated crime zones. Okay, so the escalated crime zone, when you go to cabinet, is for a, a you deem the particular area an escalated crime zone for a period, um, and I think view for the period for view for would have already um, gone by. Crime has no kind of geographical boundaries. A crime can happen anywhere, and as you, you rightfully said, we saw this weekend four homicides. None of them were in view for uh, Rodney Bay, and in castries so um, there is no I said and St. Lucia is a very small island however you use the way we determine whether or not an area is a, a es an escalated crime area is based on the data I mean you get the reports you know where the crimes happening and from that data now you can deem an area as an escalated crime zone so do you think it's discrimination in a sense 
I wouldn't say it's discrimination. I mean, if, if we cannot run away from the obvious, if we have 15 homicides in Cicero tomorrow, God forbid, um, they, I mean, naturally, you would have to deal with that particular area, and they must have a reason why um, crime is perpetuating in an area, so you have to deal with it. So I don't want to call it um, discrimination. Is there a specific number we're looking at to say, okay, five homicides would count as high? Or? No, no, the, the, the circumstances at the time can change situations, will change through it all. Um, there is no particular number that's going to um, strike off and say, okay, well, this is now an escalated crime zone. Area is deemed. Uh, I think most times, I, if I can be corrected, but if my memory serves me well, we have to go. It is a, a motion of cabinet, um, a motion of parliament that is going to determine. So it's not something that's going to be held in any any sort of secrecy type of way. We have to go to the parliament to deem an area an escalated crime zone to be able to give the police the powers to do what they need there. So the entire um, populace will be aware if a parliament sitting happens. So if it's lifted, the same process. To it or? No, I don't. I think when you go to Parliament, there is a, a particular period that they give. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, um, so you, we were talking about social programs to combat crime, but on to in re, with respect to the police police action, we know that many of these gangs are, are related in the region to Trinidad. In Trinidad, we, we see that the gangs have set up security cameras um, around police stations to, to monitor them. So we're seeing um, really a sophistication of, of gang activity, and it's more on the technological sense. How, do you, how, how will law enforcement in St. Lucia really combat that sort of escalation if it happens in St. Lucia? particularly where technology is involved. I thank God that we're not in that position in St. Lucia. Um, and it is, I mean, and as you said, you rightfully said, the situation that we have as it relates to gang violence in St. Lucia is not unique um, to St. Lucia. We've seen an escalation in crime and vi especially in gun-related violence and gun-related offenses throughout the region. And that is why I think at the last heads of CARICOM meeting, a decision was taken where the heads are going to meet to look at how they can deal with crime from a regional perspective, notwithstanding that we may have certain components or, or elements of crime that are unique to us, but from a regional, a lot of what we see happening in St. Lucia, we also see in Barbados, we see in um, St. Vincent, we see in Trinidad. So it's not something that is unique to us. So it requires regional cooperation in terms of how we go about combating. We cannot, we're, no man is an island, and an island by itself, St. Lucia is a very small island. I said, the situations where we have the high influx of firearms coming into the region is similar in Trinidad. It's the same thing in Jamaica. It's the same um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So, it's a situation where we have to come together as a region and make a determination as to the way forward. You are representing a constituency that's been um, United Workers Party for a very long time. Um, are you, have you changed the culture? Is there a different culture that you're bringing into the constituency? Um, and what does that look like? Is it difficult? And are you moving from what to what? Um, I think what I achieved at the last general election, um, as much as it was commendable, I knew that the work had only just started in terms of getting individuals to understand, especially our young people who, for many years, for many decades in the community, they refused to go to the polls. And the numbers would show you that most of the people who voted were either middle-aged or our senior individuals. However, we do have a younger population within the constituency as to why they were not voting. I was able to find out and be able to get them to come out and vote. I can tell you that the reason that they're not voting is what I'm working on now and what I've been working on from the time that we came into office. And I can almost guarantee you that we'll see them coming out again in scores at the next general election to vote. So I've been able to um, get individuals to understand, especially young people, to understand the importance of going to the ballots and cast their votes. 
to ensure that nobody um, can come and declare war on the civil servants. That's why they go to the polls to ensure that people cannot come and declare war. They go to the polls to ensure that people cannot come and say that they're not deserving of a toilet and a jetty facility. So when they understand these things, they make a concerted effort to come out. So I'm, I think that I've been able to make a dent as it relates to how people feel um, about going out and cast their votes, especially young people. Thank you. Um, we have, I think, 28 living, but we're giving 21 of them support because the others are able to um, prove, get their own means. Oh, there, but the yes, 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 through the youth economy. That's to get them to... Give them a, a grant towards um, their flight, the cost of, of FA to go to the UK. Honorable Dr. Ernest Hiller, Deputy Prime Minister, and Minister for Tourism, Investment, Creative Industries, Culture, and Information will address the nation on Wednesday, June 12 at 8 p.m. The address will be broadcast on the Government Information Service, GIS. Dr. Hilaire will discuss St. Lucia's Citizen by Investment Program, or CIP, and we invite all members of the public and press to tune in for this address. Thank you. We will now have our second presenter, Honorable Kenson Kazimi, MP for Grosely and Minister for Youth Development and Sports. Good morning. First of all, let me say happy birthday to Julian Alfred, our nation's premier athlete. I just want to provide the encouragement for her and her team. No pressure, but bring on that medal. Talk to me. Um, Naomi London, last week or the week before, would have um, made a national record. Um, if you can speak to that. Um, Naomi London ran the fastest time ever by a St. Lucian at the junior level. Unfortunately, the time cannot be recorded because the facility that was used is not yet certified. As you would appreciate the Sufre Midi Stadium, there are a number of tweaks that are required from the international community for the field to be officially certified, including the area that has to be established for a long jump pit long jump, high jump, and some other amendments that must be made that are at this time not already made. Uh, the ministry is moving speedily to ensure that we can do something in a responsible manner, in a cost-effective manner about the stadium, given the nature in which it was passed on over to us. Um, but we are very, very encouraged by the time and the progress that she is making. I said about a year or two ago that um, Naomi London, in terms of her times, are superior to what Julian Alfred ran at the same age. So it means that with the right guidance, it means that with the right amount of support, we will be having at least two or three global superstars in our midst. Okay, we saw the <coughs> tour of the Darren Cricket Stadium um, on Friday. Um, with that being done, um, has the stadium been officially handed over to the ICC body? Yes, the grounds have been officially handed over to the ICC. You would appreciate the Kent Crafton team being at this moment um, doing all the curation. You would see the design of the field. You would see work on the pitch in the outfield. So the Darren Sammy Stadium, in terms of the inside, the media center has been occupied by ICC officials as we speak. Um, the training sessions will be ongoing today, tomorrow, inside of the stadium, and we're just waiting for the external works to be complete for us to say we are 100% uh, complete in terms of our readiness for the ICC World Cup. On Friday, we had the Junior Calypso competition and on Saturday, the Pan Festival. Did you see any of that and what are your thoughts on those? Uh, I wasn't able to take in any of those. My focus has been, as a Minister of, of Sport, on the Darren Sammy Cricket Ground, so you would have found me in the Bosejou Bella Rosa, Kazaba, uh, Bonte, Kaimoje, and of course uh, the, the Rodney Bay area quite a bit on the weekend. 
Um, the event was put on by the Ministry of Education and the Creative Industries, and so the substitute ministers would have been present to take on and take in some of the talent that we have. I was able to follow some of the activities off and on on Facebook, and from all reports, the government of St. Lucia is impressed with our next generation of creatives. People are very impressed with the road rehabilitation in your constituency. Can you also speak about this? Absolutely. Uh, Grosley is a constituency that yeah, seems very gluttonous when it comes to road and infrastructure development. Uh, you would appreciate that considering that we have a large population and uh, on any given weekend, as I would say, at least 50 to 60 percent of our population would traverse our roads in Castries Grosley. And so we have embarked on some primary road network rehabilitations. I will say that uh, the contractors have done a very good job in widening the roads, especially the Kaimaji to Bosiju Road. I'm very impressed with the work actually ongoing in Belarusa, as we currently speak. This is a road that has not been given as much attention in that fast, and so I'm impressed with the amount of attention there. And of course, the Bosiju next to the Brusili Secondary School Sports Academy. That is a perennial problem every year in the hurricane season because of some massive issues that we are currently dealing with with the hopes that we don't have to come back uh, within the next year to do that rehabilitation. So we are hoping that um, some of the works during this year of infrastructure in other communities, such as Degazo, will come in very, very soon. Also, Asukana. Uh, we are currently working on the Magritte to Revent of Wood. Uh, this is a huge achievement for this government. It's a huge achievement for me as parliamentary rep, considering in times past that uh, previous individuals would have said to the Motion Universe Association, they should come up with we as a government have taken the approach that uh, from Barrio all the way to Rosalie, we will have a comfortable road as we started works on that dream. We will be moving to Aswatan now, some areas of Corrid, and in the Piat very, very soon. So I'm very encouraged by the infrastructure development in the constituency. Yeah, as you mentioned, the Borsage Road, a few of the um, residents were voicing their concerns in regards to the traffic management plan that will be going on for cricket, as well as um, when with the road rehabilitation, you all remove some of the speed bumps and whatnot. So people were voicing their concerns in regards to that because I believe that the Borsiju area was never known to have major traffic and whatnot. But now as the road has been opened, people have been voicing their concerns for that. So talk to me about that a little bit. Within the last week and a half, we've had two engagements with residents. We've had two meetings. I think everybody knows that as parliamentary work. I try my best to engage constituents as much as possible. And so we've had two Zoom meetings ahead of the get uh, The first one, we really uh, engaged them on what are our plans, and we really uh, passed it on to them to let us know their concerns. Um, in terms of traffic management, in terms of access to their homes, uh, access for their friends and their relatives, and indeed some of the infrastructural works that uh, we've undertaken. After having that first meeting, we decided in short order to have a second meeting with residents, uh, a meeting that was well attended. Over 160 people turned up, turned up at that meeting. And we were able to do both a digital registration and a physical registration for individuals to have, you know, parking and constant flow of traffic to and from their homes for friends and families. Um, in terms of the infrastructure works, we will be um, putting back the speed bumps along that road. These were certified speed bumps from the Ministry of Infrastructure. As you would appreciate, there is still work that has to be happening after Cricket World Cup. And so we'll endeavor to ensure that we provide as much health and safety for commuters and for persons in that community um, going forward. We also, I also want to, as MP, encourage people to use roads in a more prudent manner. I mean, the second, the second we did that road, everybody is shouting, yeah, cap it. And so <laughs> in communities, we do have speed limits, and we know it's supposed to be under 30 kilometers per hour. And so we encourage people to continue to adhere to the laws of this land and use these roads responsibly. Yeah, um, Mr. Minister, yeah. as we prepare for this, this um, World Cup, you know, it's a global event. We have locals, visitors. But as the um, MP for Grosile, how concerned are you? How satisfied are you with the security measure? You know, I know it's not <laughs> directly under your portfolio, mm -hmm. but as the MP for the area, you into sports, you know, there's been some concerns from the public as to the brazenness of crime in broad daylight, especially like over the weekend, broad daylight, I had somebody complaining that. But I know the police are doing the, the bit because the government has been providing vehicles. But how satisfied or how concerned are you that, 
you know, we could, um, St. Lucia could afford to, you know, to, to, to take on, cater for, you know, an event of that magnitude and making sure that the citizens are safe and the visitors also. To be very frank, um, St. Lucia has had a very good record when it comes to actual global events, especially sporting events and safety and security. Um, I don't know if anybody in the media can recall any point where we've hosted a CPL game, a black hat game, an international cricket game, and we've had incidents of crime um, at Darren Samuel within the community or the constituency. As a matter of fact, I think sports is the answer to ensure that people are better engaged. Young people are given a platform to you know, apply their skills, and that's why we've had a semi-professional league um, that is why we have a high performance center for cricket. That is why we have a youth uh, high performance program for football with Stuart Charles and Earl Paul Hogsha. And uh, I really do believe that some of those programs, the, uh, the time factor will yield the results that we want, but I don't think there is any one answer that will curb any crime situation at this present moment. But I think it's important for every single minister and ministry to do their part in ensuring that you, you engage young people. And I think uh, my Ministry of Youth Development and Sports, we continue to do that for our YRE program, um, pretty much getting in touch with disengaged young people to make them more engaged in better activities. Um, and through a number of our sports and youth programs that we have. And so I believe with the presence of the Minister of, so of, of, of Local Security and also the presence of the Commissioner on our local organizing committee that they put everything in place to ensure we have a safe event. Mr. Minister, mm. um, a political meeting was held in your constituency yesterday. It was? At the Grand River Primary School. Mm. Um, notwithstanding all the investments you have, significant investments you have made in that, on that school. Um, the leader of the opposition, in one of his closing statements, did make some remarks. Mm. Uh, speaking of war, and putting public servants on notice. As parliamentary rep and minister for youth and sports, perhaps a, a call out to yeah. our young people? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not a laughing ma matter. We have a, a national issue on our hand as it pertains to crime and violence. And we just had a question there being asked about what are our security measures put in place ahead of the World Cup. And I think the rhetoric from myself and from most of the members of the party I represent has been peace and security and engagement and doing the right things and really um, clamping down on illicit behavior. And so it's sad that a political leader and a former prime minister would have that approach of calling for like war and, you know, and that sort of stuff. I just don't think that rhetoric is what we need in this country right now. I think the rhetoric we need is to identify the different social structures that need to be strengthened and to, to ensure that we strengthen those social structures and ensure that you know, collectively we come together to do something about the situation that we have. Of course, um, I've had conversations with my peers, with other ministers of youth on what it is that we can do. And in none of our conversations, not one, have we ever had some notion that the best way to deal with crime in this country is war. And uh, the best way to do it is to call out everybody to get mad and be upset. I think that further exacerbates the situation. And I think it would behoove every single one of us to search ourselves and find out what it is we could do to curb the situation as opposed to um, having rhetoric that could only, only seek to get us in a worse situation. One second, eh? for a sex offenders registry. Um, um, that was in relation to some cases at that time. Um, what, what are your thoughts on, on having a sex offenders registry? And what is the, any thrust by this administration to have such? Okay, that would fall under the Minister of um, Internal Security and uh, that would fall under purview. Um, and so in terms of the progress on whether or not that has been established, I think that's a question that's better directed at them. But for me, I think um, as a father of twin girls, I, I, I've, I've made it a personal sort of position that I don't speak on behalf of any government when I say that I would like to know 
if a sex offender is coming to my community so that I can better be able to speak to my daughters and uh, get them to even have their antennas up further. That's my position, that's always been my position, that's going to continue to be my position.